Hi everybody, it's Susan with Susan Monroe Art and I'm so excited for today's tutorial. I'm going to talk about how to paint shadows on your watercolors so that they look really luminous and vibrant and don't look muddy and just dark. And I've got a really simple method I use. I have a mixture of three colors that I really, really like to use almost all the time on all my shadows. Um, let me give you an example. So this picture, hopefully y'all can see the whole thing, with all these ladles I did recently. I use this shadow color on every single one of these ladles. Every single ladle is a different color. I did maybe a little adjustment with each one, but all in all, they used my base shadow color as the basis for the shadows in this picture. So I'm going to tell you how I did that. I'm going to talk about painting shadows wet on wet. I'm going to talk about painting shadows wet on dry, that's wet paint on dry paper. I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of the paper you use and hopefully just give some help in creating really beautiful shadows on your watercolors because I think the number one thing that can make your watercolor successful is the contrast and that's having your darks dark enough and your lights light enough and this will really help with that. So um, I'd also like to thank you for watching this video. I know there are a lot of art videos out there you can choose from, so thanks for choosing mine. I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up or uh, subscribe to my channel or even leave a comment. I love when people comment. I like to answer those because any interaction you can do with the video will help me get picked up by the YouTube algorithm and then more people will see it and then I can share my love of watercolor with more people. So that being said, let's go on and get busy. I'm going to start by talking about the different parts of a shadow, and then we're going to move on to the actual shadow painting. So let's go. So before we learn how to paint a shadow, I wanted to show the different parts of a shadow and how a shadow is made up. And to do that, I'm going to use an egg and a flashlight. So now I shine the flashlight down on the egg. And the different parts of the shadow that we see are the highlight, the lightest part of the shadow. And there are midtones, darker than the highlight, but lighter than this sort of band that goes around here. That's the core shadow. Let me move my flashlight so you can see that a little better. The core shadow. And down under here, it is a little lighter. So beneath the core shadow, you'll have a lighter area, and that is the reflected light. Okay? So your object will reflect whatever it's sitting on. It'll reflect the color of whatever it's sitting on, and since the surface is white, we have a white reflected shadow. And then this is the cast shadow. Okay? So we have highlight, midtone, core shadow, reflected light, cast shadow. And the darkest part of any shadow is always this little crease right here, this area where your object meets the table or whatever it's sitting on. Now what happens if we change the color of the surface? I'm going to get a purple piece of paper and I'll put our egg back on here with my flashlight. You see we still have the, whoop, the highlight the midtone, the core shadow, and the cast shadow is reflecting some of that purple that's on the surface that the egg is sitting on. So when you paint it, you would definitely want to include a little purple in your shadow. And what if we change it to, just for grins, let's do yellow. Set my egg on the yellow surface, and you can definitely see, of course, the yellow that's in the reflected light. So never forget, every object will have some reflected light if it has a cast shadow like this. Now, okay, now that we've talked about the parts of the shadow, I'm going to give you my super secret recipe for uh, the mixture I use to make my shadows. And actually, it's, it's no secret. It's a fairly common mixture. I use ultramarine blue mixed with yellow ochre and alizarin crimson. So basically what we're doing is using the three primary colors, blue, yellow, and red, 
to make a neutral color to use for the shadows, but it's a neutral color that can be adjusted to be warmer or cooler. If you don't have ultramarine blue, yellow ochre, and alizarin crimson, that's fine. You can use any yellow, blue, and red that you have. I've, I've switched it up sometimes, depending on what I want to do, play around a little bit. But this has been my basic shadow color mixture for a long time. And I put the colors in in about these proportions. Let me. I put the most definitely would be the ultramarine blue. So I'm saying proportionately, I put in say this much ultramarine blue, a medium amount of yellow ochre, and then by far the smallest amount would be the alizarin crimson because it is a strong color and it will turn the whole thing a little red. The other thing is though that as you add these colors you're going to see that you can adjust it as you're adding to get that neutral. You don't have to just I put three in. Oh my gosh, it doesn't work. I have to start over again. Now, let me show you. So this is my ultramarine blue. Big puddle of fairly strong ultramarine blue. Now I'm going to add my yellow ochre. It's really dulled that down to sort of a gray blue. And then I'm going to add my alizarin crimson. All right, let's see what neutral color I have here. It's a neutral gray. And just pull it out right here. So you can see that's a really nice neutral gray. Um, it's wonderful for using on top of your watercolors because, as we know, watercolors are transparent. So you put this on top and then the base color, the body color of whatever object you're painting will shine through the shadow color. The other interesting thing about these colors is they tend to separate a little bit. I don't know if you can see in here, but the blue is separated a little from the red and the yellow. I frequently have to mix it back together. I really like this separation. I think it adds a lot of interest to the shadows. You can see there's a little separation with the ultramarine blue in what I've painted right here. And that's because ultramarine blue is a granulating color. It has a granulated look when it dries. I think you can see it here. If you don't like that, of course, you could always use a different blue. Cobalt blue would be a good alternate choice for that. This is the, the mixture I like. All right, so I've got this nice neutral. I would say it's a pretty warm neutral. Say I want to cool that neutral down. Super easy. I am simply going to add a little more blue to my mixture. Here I have a much more blue shadow. I really like using a, a bluer color for my shadows, depending on what I'm painting. Or say I'm painting something that's white and there's reflected light on it. I find white a lot of the time has sort of a yellow tone to it when there's reflected light. And so I would just add a little more yellow ochre to give a more yellowish tone to my shadow. Sometimes I'll even add a yellow. This is Windsor yellow, but you could add whatever yellow you have. It will just give a different color you can use for your reflected light. You can see how variable this color is when you put it onto things. You can adjust it so many different ways. Warm, cool, reflected. Let me add a little more red and do one that's more of a, you have a very purple shadow. Pop it in here. So you can adjust your shadow to according to what you like and what you're painting. All those will work great for a shadow. And then I was mentioning earlier how the watercolor will shine through the shadow color. So let me give you an example of that up here. 
Like I said, I like a bluer shadow color, so I'm going to add a little more blue to this. Blue is in pretty much every shadow color. I don't really think you can make a shadow without a lot of blue. See how that is? Yep, I like that. So when I apply the shadow color on top of an already painted piece, you have to do it very lightly. I don't want to stir up the granules of color that are already laid down on the page because your watercolor is pigment mixed with water and binders and things like that. If I scrub too hard, the pigment that is dried down here will reactivate, become wet again, and mix up with my shadow color and become sort of mud. So I would paint lightly to show my shadows. Let's do it over the yellow. And then over the red. And I, I always make sure to pick up that extra paint at the end when I do these shadows, this little extra drop you get when you lift your brush. Otherwise, you can end up with a, a dark spot like that. And I think you can see how the blue shines through, the yellow shines through, the red shines through, making the shadow color perfect for pretty much anything. Now why don't we get into actually shading something. I will paint a circle and shade that. Let's try a different color. I'm going to use some sap green. And I'm going to let this green dry before I add the shadow. I'm going to paint my shadow on this circle or sphere, as it will be, um, wet paint on dry paper, wet on dry. You can also use this technique and of course paint wet in wet. It requires some control, um, but why don't we go for that? What color do I want to do that one? Let's do that one in an orange. And I will, while we're waiting for this one to dry, I will show painting with these colors wet on wet. I don't think I chose my orange. I think I chose one of my reds, but that's okay. And I'd add some orange to it. So when you're painting wet on wet with a shadow color, you have to move quickly. And the first thing I want to do is lift out the highlight with a dry brush. So I'm going to dry my brush on a paper towel and lift out that paint. I'm trying to soak up as much as I can. I think this is a pretty staining color. I won't go back to complete white, but it's doing a pretty good job. You could leave the circle just completely white and dry if you want, and that would be more of a hard reflection. I'm going for more of a soft reflection here. And I can even soak up some of that paint with my paper towel. So here we have a soft highlight. I'm going to pick just a little up in the mid-tone. We want that gradation from light to dark to be very soft and smooth using just a damp brush to pick up some of that. And now I'm going to go in and add the core shadow wet on wet around here. When we do the core shadow this way, It's going to, of course, pick up the body color, which is not necessarily a bad thing. You just want to control the flow a little bit. And I find the easiest way to control that is with a damp brush, not totally dry. I want to go in and gently do this back and forth, sort of a zigzag motion sometimes to help ease the color in and make a soft gradation from light to dark. Put a little more further down. I have not forgotten the reflected light. All right, now I'm gonna completely dry my brush and I'm gonna come in here and lift this wet paint out to show my reflected light. There we go. 
Now, if I wanted to make any other changes to this, I would definitely wait until it completely dry and then continue adding color to the shadows. All right, my orange ball has dried and I'm going to add the cast shadow to it. So my light source is coming, say from up here, draw a little sunshine. There's my sun. So I know my shadow is going to be back this way. So let's just do a little bit of shadow. The shadow will not just be behind it, but also under it. Don't forget that. Sometimes the cast shadow has a soft edge. Sometimes it has a hard edge, depending on how focused the light is, giving this one sort of a soft shadow. And as I said, the place where there is the darkest shadow is this area right underneath the object where it meets the surface it's sitting on. Let me let that dry and I'll do just one more thing and we'll be done with this one. So I think this shadow looks fine the way it is now, but if I really want to bump it up a little bit, give it some extra luminosity, a little extra glow, I'm going to take my shadow color, put some of it over here, and I'm going to add some of the body color, the color of the object, a little of this orangey pinky that I have here. And now that this is dry, I'm going to come lightly across. I don't want to stir this up again. Lightly across and add that shadow. the same shape, that crescent shape. Now I'm going to rinse my brush, gently dab it off, and once again do my sort of back and forth motion, easing that shadow color into the rest of the piece. And then I think you get a really beautiful, colorful shadow there. Um, that picks up the cover, color of the object, but also is, is dark and has some interest because of the granulation of the ultramarine blue. As I said, if you don't like that look, use cobalt blue instead. That's a perfectly fine alternative for that. I would also probably add a little bit of orange down to this shadow, because you have reflected light up here. You would also have reflected light down here. Surface beneath is going to also reflect the color of the object. I'm just going to add a touch more orange right into this area. I don't want the, cat, the reflected light to look quite so white. Now let me show you how to do the wet on dry technique. My green circle is totally dry and I want to make a highlight at the top, just like I did for the orange one. So I'm taking a wet brush and gently scrubbing a circle to lift the dry paint. I'm not really sure how staining this is. I'll just keep scrubbing. And I can enlarge that circle a little bit just to make it softly go into the uh, softer shadow area. but I still want it to be whiter, so I'm gonna blot out a little bit with the paper towel. You could even rub a little bit. You just wanna be gentle, you don't wanna mess up the paper. And I'm gonna smooth in that line that I made. But with a soft brush, sometimes you just don't have enough strength. This is a scrubber brush that I got, um, and it's meant for scrubbing out. And this is an oil brush that I have that I frequently use for scrubbing uh, out areas. It's almost like an eraser for your watercolors. So I'll wet that and then gently scrub in that area. Again, not too hard. The brush with the firmer bristles can remove a little more color. Now I'll blot it off with my paper towel. Now I think I need to mix up a little more of my shadow color. My shadow color at the top has been contaminated with the orange, so let me do that. 
And I think I'm going to make this one a little more reddish, more of a purple shadow, just so you can see. Uh, see, now there I added way too much yellow ochre. So no worries. It's sort of a push and pull that you do with this. I added too much yellow ochre, so now I'll just add some more blue. Then it's too blue. I can add more red. I can just go back and forth adding colors until I get the exact shade that I want for my shadows. That's a nice sort of purpley color. So let's see what happens when I use a purple shadow on here. I'm going to add a little crescent shape once again. Your shadow will follow the contour of the object. And I want to make it nice and dark. So I get that good contrast and rinse my brush. Just make it damp, dab off a little bit, and now I'm using that zigzag motion again. Now I want to make sure that my brush is just damp, not wet. If there's too much water on my brush, it'll make a bubble of water sort of right here and then push the paint back. Push the paint where I back and make a, a hard edge at the bottom. So just make sure the brush is just damp. You might have to experiment a little bit to get this down, but I'm going to blend it in a little more. And now I'm going to soften that bottom edge with a damp brush as well. Here we go. And just to make a really intense shadow, I'm going to add a little green, a little of body color to my shadow color. And it's really going to make that shadow luminous and, and, and bright. I haven't forgotten my reflected light. I'm just drying my brush and lift off some of that paint down there just to give a hint of reflected light. Now, if you remember, I said that the color of the surface will reflect up onto the object. So let's see what happens if I paint yellow under the green ball. And now that the surface of the table is yellow, that yellow is going to reflect onto the green ball. And I can just drop a little yellow into that reflected shadow area. And it really will help the pieces look like they go together. And I'm going to mix up some new shadow color once again, because my other two were contaminated with other colors. And I'm going to paint the cast shadow under the ball. I'm going to give this shadow more of a hard edge and not soften it like I did the other one. Since it's a sphere, the, the shadow is going to reflect that circular shape. And remember the darkest area is under here where the object meets the table, where the rubber meets the road. And I can just dot that in wet and wet. And I want to add a little green reflection onto the table. Since the object reflects its surface and the surface reflects the object. And there you go. I think those are pretty good representations of my technique for making shadows. The one thing that's bugging me is this reflected light is just too, too white. I mean, put a little more orange in there just to make me happy. This orange mix with a little of the shadow color. There. There we go. That's more like it. The last thing I wanted to talk about was the difference that paper makes in using this shadow technique. So this is Arches paper. It's 100% cotton. It's cold pressed, uh, 140 pound. When I was preparing to do this video, I did some test paintings on some Canson paper that I have. So here's my Canson watercolor paper. I was having a terrible time making, making the technique work. 
I started thinking there's something wrong with me. The color separated so much and it wouldn't get dark enough. And then it got too dark and things weren't blending properly. And um, finally, I just decided to try my normal paper, my arches, and everything went together really well. I think the difference between the papers, uh, I'm not sure what Canson is made out of, but I think having the 100% cotton, that it just absorbs the watercolor a little more quickly. Uh, those colors sink in and you have a little more control over them. Whereas on this, I felt like the colors were sitting more on the surface and it gave my ultramarine blue a lot more time to granulate. And I came up with some really intense granulation, which I was not a fan of. And also when I was lifting things off, since the paper hadn't absorbed as much, I ended up lifting off too much. The less expensive paper was just difficult to work with. So I'm just saying that in case someone has paper that is is not 100% cotton and you're working with this technique and you're experiencing some difficulty, just remember it might be your paper. It might not be you. Uh, Arches is an expensive paper. I'm not familiar with a lot of other brands because Arches is what I use all the time, but I'm sure there are other 100% cotton papers out there that would fit the bill to do this. I hate to kick Canson, but it, it just didn't work for this technique. So there you go. I hope that you found this video to be helpful. I hope you'll use this technique and let me know how it goes. And uh, once again, I want to say thank you for watching. I hope you'll give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Leave a comment or a question. And some suggestions for a few of my other videos will be popping up if you like this one. I hope you'll take a look at them as well. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.